Hi there. We are going to talk about the integumentary system. So specifically, we're going to go in this video, talk about the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. Let's get started with that epidermis. So the general features of the ep epidermis is going to include keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Wow, that's a mouthful. So let's just go ahead and break it down. So when we talk about squamous, if you recall from your histology, that's going to talk about the shape of those cells. They are going to be in that flattened shape. And so stratified means that you have layers of the cells. Keratinized, keratinized is going to be including of inclusive of those dead skin cells at the surface. They're going to be packed with tough keratin proteins and they're going to slough off. And so your epidermis is avascular, meaning A, meaning not. So that means it does not have vascularity. Um, it's going to depend on the diffusion of the nutrients from the underlying connective tissue. That's where that vascularity is going to lie. And that's where it's going to get all of its nutrients from. It also, the epidermis contains sparse nerve endings for touch and pain. So you have five epidermal cell types. So we're going to go into those. Number one, keratinocytes. Two, stem cells. Three, melanocytes. Four, tactile cells. And five, dendritic cells. So your keratinocytes, they're going to make up a majority of those cells. And it's in the name. They are what synthesize the keratin. So the next question is, well, what makes the keratinocytes? Well, your stem cells are going to give rise to keratinocytes. Um, what that, what the stem cells are really, no matter where they are located in the body, they're defined as undifferentiated cells, meaning they have genetic, uh, the genetic code, but those cells have not yet turned on, I'm quoting, I'm air quoting back here, have not yet turned on what they're going to turn into. And that's what they mean by undifferentiated. So when you have these undifferentiated cells in the epidermis, those are going to differentiate into keratinocytes. And you're going to find those in the very deepest layer, and that's going to be the stratum basale. And we're going to talk about the layers here in the next couple of slides. Number three, your melanocytes. I bet you can guess that one right there. They are going to synthesize a pigment called melanin. And the purpose of the melanin is to shield, uh, shield your DNA from ultraviolet radiation. Different individuals have different melanin production abilities. That depends on their DNA. Um, in a later PowerPoint, we will discuss what that looks like. We're just going to go ahead and learn about the cells in this PowerPoint. And so you're only going to find them in the stratum basale, but they do have branching process that is going to help to spread the melanin among the keratinocytes. And so um, they are distributed via something called melanosomes. Number four, tactile cells. I bet you got that one. Think about touch, tactile. And so they are touch receptors. They are going to be associated with dermal nerve fibers. So the nerve fibers themselves are, they're, they're associated in that dermis, but you're going to have those collections uh, that are going to extend to the epidermis. And so those collections, we're going to call them tactile discs. That's basically a group of tactile cells that are associated with that nerve fiber. You're going to find those tactile cells and those discs in that basal layer of the epidermis. So as you can see, there's a lot going on in that basal layer of the epidermis. Number five are dendritic cells. Um, what those do, those are phagocytic immune cells. They help to guard against toxins, microbes, any type of antigen that is trying to make way into the body. And those are going to be found in different layers. It's going to be found in the stratum spinosum and the, strat the stratum granulosum. 
So let's learn about these layers. So as you look here, here is an actual microscopic view. And then we got our nice little drawing to go ahead and support that. So this layer here, the whitish layer, that's the dermis. You're looking at the dermis. And as you can see in this drawing, you're going to have your nerve ending, your blood vessels, excuse me, uh, your nerve endings. And then you have the tactile cells that are going to go ahead and extend to the epidermis stratum basale. So you can see that right there. So let's get started with the actual epidermis. The epidermis is going to include from the most deep to the most superficial, the stratum basale, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidium, and stratum corneum. Okay. So as I was telling you in the last ones where the stratum basale is, the stratum basale is going to be this layer of cells right there. Boom. And those are where you're going to find stem cells, excuse me, stem cells also. So you can see this stem cell right here. It's in the process of my, mitosis. And so what happens is the stem cells that are found here are going to mitotically divide. Here's another one right here. They're going to mitotically divide and start adding to the layers. So that you have your stratum spinosum. That is several different layers. We're going to go into them individually in each of the PowerPoints. So the stratum spinosum is going to be followed by that stratum granulosum, which is actually a little bit of a thinner layer. You can see you have some living keratinocytes here. So this is the end of those living keratinocytes. Now, when you get into the stratum lucidium, stratum lucidium is going to be the layer on top and the corneum is where you're going to definitely find those dead keratinocytes. So these are the living cells and then these are going to be the dead cells, okay? Uh, as you can see here, you're going to get that sloughing off exfoliation of those dead cells. There are lots and lots and lots of layers to slough off. So as these layers slough off, the bottom layers that are undergoing mitotic division are then going to push up and become the next layer into that stratum spinosum. And then mitotic division pushes up and it pushes up and pushes up and pushes up and pushes up. These living keratinocytes are then going to push up, become dead keratinocytes, and then eventually slough off. So the, the, um, the making of the new skin takes place at the very bottom layer, the stratum basale, because this right here is the layer that is receiving the nutrients and it's receiving the nutrients from the blood vessels um, of the actual of the actual dermis. So go through all of this, understand. We do in our later PowerPoints go into all of the very specific uh, structures of the dermis and also all of the supporting structures too. So you may not learn it in this very one picture, but I am pointing it out now too. I like this, here's your sweat pore and you can see the sweat that you have on the top of your skin, that pore actually goes deep, 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 and originates in that dermis. I don't want to go into the dermis too much because that's not what this PowerPoint is at this point. All righty, so let's go into the layers of the epidermis, going from the most deep to the most superficial. They're arranged in four to five zones. Uh, I call them layers. Let's make sure we understand that they're also called strata. That is going to be a very common name that you're going to hear a lot. So the first strata is going to be the stratum basale. The stratum basale is just like I showed you that single layer of stem cells and keratinocytes. They're going to rest directly on the basement membrane. And that is where they receive their nutrients from. So they are anchored to that basement membrane. You're also going to find within the stratum basale, uh, melanocytes and those tactile cells that I showed you on the previous slides. On top of that, your stratum spinosum. Uh, you're going to have several different layers within that stratum spinosum. And those layers are um, layers of living 
keratinocytes. Also, those keratinocytes are going to be joined with junctions of desmosomes and also tight junctions too. You covered your junctions in the previous power in the previous chapters and also in bio 1111. So, they're also named for their parents of cells uh, because after that preparation, they give this spiny appearance. That's why they call, call them spinosum. Um, they also contain some dendritic cells too. So uh, dendrites are going to be extensions of your nerve body. Now you have your stratum granulosum, number three. Strenu granulosum is going to be a lot less layers, about three to five layers of very flat living, they're still living, keratinocytes, okay? They're going to have a dark staining uh, granules called keratohyalin. And so that's really what's going to be the determining factor. So let's find that granulosum. Do you see how they are so much darker? There's this darker, darker, darker layer here. All righty. Number four is your stratum lucidium. Your stratum lucidium is very thin. It's very pale. Um, it's only found in your thicker skin, okay? It's going to be packed with a clear protein called um, elodin. And that when we say in your thicker skin, that's going to be that fifth layer that is found in your palms and in your soles of your feet. And if you are a monkey that has a prehensile tail, you will also find them there. Moving on to your stratum corneum. Uh, it's going to have up to 30 layers of dead scaly keratinized cells. Okay. These are dead scales, uh, cells. That's why they are scaly. So they are going to resist abrasion and penetration and water loss. So this is very, very important for protection of your skin. So as you notice, if you walk around without shoes on a lot, without shoes and socks, the way nature intended you, right? You probably have a very, very, thick stratum corneum uh, because your feet have um, built up lots and lots of layers of dead scaly skin, the keratinized cells. So you could always get yourself a little, a little puma stone, puma set really nice, put some lotion on it and throw some socks and shoes because nature didn't really intend us to be like we are, right? All righty. So let's move on. So when it comes to the life history of the keratinocytes, I'm going to kind of scoot through this a little bit because really this is stuff you can read. Um, like I told you before, they're produced by mitotic division in the stratum basale and also even in the deeper part of the stratum spinosum. Okay. Mitosis is going to require oxygen and nutrients. That's why they are in the very lowest levels. Those that are the closest to uh, the dermis because it needs to get those nutrients and oxygen from those blood vessels. And so once the cells migrate away from the blood vessels, mitotic division doesn't occur in those cells anymore. And so, like I told you before, when we we're going over the pictures, new keratinocytes are gonna push older ones towards that surface, more superficial, um, and over time, they're going to get flatter and flatter, produce more keratin, fill up, um, fill up with lipid-filled lamellar granules, starting to get the fat, the lipid-filled in there. There's going to be about 30 to 40 days of ker keratinocyte that makes its way to the skin before it flakes off or exfoliates, sloughs off. Okay. And so it can also be seen as what we might call as dander or dandruff. And so those keratinocytes are going to uh, multiplicate as you get older and they're going to multi multiply faster when you're injured or when the skin is stressed. Like I told you in the last slide, 
you can get callus or corns, which are thick accumulations of those dead kerat kerat keratinocytes on the hands of the feet. All righty. So four very important events that are going to uh, take place in that stratum glanulosum is going to be uh, these keratohyaline granules are going to fill with filigrin. That is a protein that helps to bind keratin into tough bundles, okay? So it helps to aggregate them, helps to get them together. Um, then the cells are going to start producing really tough envelopes beneath their membranes. From there, the membrane coating vesicles are going to release lipids, a lipid mixture that spreads over the cell surface. This right here that I'm explaining is waterproofing. This is why your skin is waterproof. And it's really important that your skin is waterproof because without your skin being waterproof, we would lose a lot of our body water via um, evaporation to the environment. And our body needs to maintain its body water. So if you have had a severe burn that is over a large part of your skin and then goes deep enough to destroy this waterproofing layer, it could be actually very detrimental to you because you could lose a lot of body water without this waterproofing. And that's why this is here, talking about why this is a very important event. Okay, so then... Uh, those keratinocytes, the organelles, are going to begin to degenerate and the cells are going to die. Okay, that's going to leave that waterproofing sac enclosed in bundles, in bundles of keratin. All righty, so then um, I think I've just explained the whole, the whole PowerPoint. I guess I don't really need to look at this. And so uh, it doesn't completely prevent the absorption of water. Okay. That's why when you're, when you soak in a bath, your fingers are going to prune or they could plump. It really depends on the osmotic nature of your bathtub. All right. So let's move on. Let's move on to the dermis and the hypodermis. So the dermis, it's going to be underneath the epidermis. Okay. Generally, your dermis is going to contain connective tissue layers of point two millimeters to four millimeters thick. If you want to get out your ruler so you can see exactly what that looks like, sometimes it helps to really connect to what that might look like. Your dermis is going to be mainly composed of collagen. It will also contain some elastic fibers and some reticular fibers too. Has lots of uh, blood vessels, okay, well supplied with blood vessels. Remember, the blood vessels in the dermis are going to supply the stratum bacilli, which are the living layers of the epidermis, I'm sorry, the one living layer of the epidermis with the nutrients that it needs. So that's where all your well-supplied blood vessels are. This is also where your sweat glands are going to begin. Um, you also have sebaceous glands and nerve endings. So this is really important. This little... Um, tick right there is to let you know what is going to be in the dermis. So I definitely would study that. Um, it will also house hair follicles and where the nail roots are. So your face, your muscles of your face are going to be used for expression. Okay. So those muscles are going to be attached to the dermis. So when your facial muscles move, it's moving the dermis. And that dermis is then going to express what is going on on the outside. But really, it's coming from the inside, isn't it? Okay, so your dermis is wavy. And I'm sorry, there is a wavy conspicuous boundary between the dermis and the epidermis. If you recall our previous picture, it's not just one straight line across, okay? And so we're going to call the upward extensions that look like little fingers that stick up, we're going to call those dermal, dermal papillae, okay? And then 
the downward waves of it, we're going to call those epidermal ridges. So the papillary uh, layer, the papillary layer, papillary layer is going to be very thin zone of areolar tissue. Okay. It's going to be near that dermal papillae. It's going to allow for leukocytes and other defense cells to be very mobile within them. And it's going to also be very rich in smaller blood vessels. The reticular layer is going to be deeper. It's the deeper, thick layer of the dermis. It's going to be mainly composed of dense, irregular connective tissue. If you recall in your uh, histology, dense connective tissue, if you recall, has more of the actual um, fibers and less of the actual um, uh, less of the actual fluid. So it's going to be more dense. And the fact that makes it irregular, it doesn't look like it is going in these wavy patterns that just can uh, go with, with the flow. It is all over the place in different directions. And so if that helps you kind of identify, I hope it does. All righty. So what stretch marks are, because that's what we really want to know. Um, stretch marks are going to be tears in that collagen fiber. That's going to be caused by the stretching of the skin. That happens when the skin gets stretched very quickly and doesn't have that opportunity to uh, take its time to get larger, okay? That happens during pregnancy or obesity. And a lot of times you don't really see the stretch mark until you got a little bit smaller. And then you realize that the skin did not uh, have that time to get more spread out and stretched. And that's when you see those stretch marks. All right, so you can damage your dermal blood vessels. Burns, friction, those can cause basically serous fluid inside to seep out and form blisters. And those blisters take place between the dermis and the epidermis. So all of that takes place in that reticular layer. All right, so let's go ahead and look at it. Um, you see here, let's go to the bottom one since we did that first, the reticular layer of the dermis. So you're gonna find that deeper as it is showing you. The papillary layer of the dermis, that is going to be more towards that basement membrane. So this is deep, this is superficial when we're talking about the dermis, okay? But if we add on the epidermis, we can say that the epidermis is more superficial than the dermis. I hope adding that vocabulary and directionality helps you out. All right, so next, the hypodermis. The hypodermis is gonna be subcutaneous tissue. It's going to be the connective tissue that is actually beneath the skin itself. It's going to have more areolar. That's a hard one, man. I will stutter over that every time. I'll tell you how to work it out. R-E-O-L-A-R, areolar. Just can't say it fast. All right, so it contains a lot more areolar tissue and adipose tissue than the dermis itself, okay? Helps to pad the body, bind the skin to the underlying tissues. It's going to be a common site where drug injections are going to take place because it has even more blood vessels. You're going to find your subcutaneous fat there. Um, the subcutaneous fat is the adipose tissue that is in that subcutaneous level uh, layer. And what is the purpose of that subcutaneous fat? It is to serve as energy reservoir. If you recall from your bio 1111, long-term energy storage is what your, uh, what your triglycerides are gonna be used for. Specifically, your, uh, your fatty acids are gonna be used for energy reservoir for thermal insulation. So we all need a little bit of thermal insulation. Guess what? Women have a little bit more than guys. Um, it's not for that, fact with the thermal insulation as much as 
women are supposed to be child rearing. And because of that, we tend to hold on to more of that subcutaneous fat, adipose tissue. And the purpose for that is long-term energy storage when we need to feed our offspring. All righty, so last but not least, um, your subcutaneous fat is going to be thinner in your infants and your elderly. But if you recall from previous chapter, your, your infants actually have a different type of fat. They're going to have brown fat, and that brown fat is going to pack a big energy value. So when it comes to elderly, you'll notice that um, if you look at their skin, they don't have a lot of subcutaneous fat. Their skin becomes very thin and sits directly um, on those, well, not directly on those muscles, but appearance of directly on those muscles. Last but not least, what happens if you get burned? Okay, so we have first degree burns, second degree burns, and third degree burns. Third degree burns are going to be the worst. Most often they're gonna require skin grafts. Okay, so you got a couple of different types of grafts. You have an autograft, an autograft, and an allograft. An autograft is when you're going to take tissue from another location on that same person's body. Okay, an allograft is when you're going to take tissue from somebody else's body and put it on the burn victim. So it's usually a deceased donor. And so just to kind of start throwing that information in, there's also artificial and lab-based approaches to help with that. As you can see here, this is a mesh skin graft that um, can be available when it comes down to skin grafting. We're not going to go into this too, too much. You're going to learn in the future that it really depends on how big the burn is, meaning what is a surface area in which was burned, okay? The second thing is how deep is it? How deep is that burn? How, how much does it penetrate? And from there, the experts decide what's the best treatment. So I hope this was interesting. Um, let me know if you have any questions.